the king of market cycles, is about to explain what comes next. Now, if you've been watching my videos, you might think I'm the king of market cycles. I've been certainly talking a lot about them. Three revolutionary cycles that are converging, but a lot of the information, education, and research that I have come up with is from my guest right now. I'm talking about Harry Dent. Now before, I know, before you dismiss this and say, but Harry Dent's always wrong, he's a perma bear, uh, the broken clock will be right, uh, eventually kind of a thing. Uh, understand that Harry Dent is right, his research is spot on, and if you haven't taken the time to read, to read his books, then you probably don't understand the nuance that's in there. Um, he has called for a crash in the market, and while markets seem to still be running higher, that's only because of the federal stimulus that's been printed. If you deduct the money, the markets start looking a lot different. So anyway, um, he is right, his analysis is right, his research onto demographics and cycles is super important. It's part of my work and I think you need to understand. So we're going to talk to Harry. Um, we're going to talk about the three harbingers of a revolution. We're going to talk about technology cycles that move the world. We're going to talk about demographics, which is probably the biggest driver of what's happening in the world. We're going to talk about which countries are going to be the biggest losers and which countries will be the biggest beneficiaries, the winners, in just the next couple of years. You have to understand this so you know where to move your money. He's going to talk about what he thinks is going to happen with the market and how you can sidestep that to survive it, to thrive when the market comes back. So much more good stuff with Harry. Now, I do want to say that Harry Dent is going to be, I'm proud to say he's going to be a speaker at my next event, marketdisruptorslive.com. Um, again, I've gotten so much of my research and work from what Harry has done. I'm super excited to have him there in person and hopefully you will be as well. So come hang out with me, meet me, meet Harry Dent, uh, Daniel DiMartino Booth, George Gammon, Luke Grauman, um, Robert Breedlove, and so many others, marketdisruptorslive.com. There's a link down below. And with that, let's go ahead and just jump right into the interview with Harry Dent. Uh, Harry, uh, thanks so much for joining me again today. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm super excited about this. Um, <laughs> Great to be back, Mark. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've told you, I mean, I've read, I think, four or five of your books uh, over the last 15 years or so. I've uh, been super helpful for me kind of uh, figuring out how things go. Um, just give us a, just give us like a background on, uh, on what you're working on right now and what you're doing. Well, you know, I mean, really, I mean, I, I'm an economist that was not trained as an economist. I mean, I took the normal, I, I majored in, in economics got through three courts and said, no, I'm learning more in all my other business courses than this. So I went to accounting and finance and then went to Harvard Business School and focused on management and marketing, all the business stuff, because that's how the world really works. And, and, and I just found like, economists are all in theories. They, they don't, there's no real stuff. And so I actually, you know, was consulting to Fortune 100 companies in business strategy, which means I have to look out in the future to plot their strategy. And then I started working with new ventures, which are much more exciting because that's my type of stuff, disruptors, creating new things, changing the world. And then I really had to, you know, well, I was seeing the future for the first time. I was saying, oh, man, these aren't the old guys. These are the new companies that are creating stuff that's going to be big five or 10 years from now. So right. that's when I really got it. So I just started doing my own research and, and, and past trends and cycles. And I'm like, my God, and it was even better than I, I, I knew there were cycles. Right. I studied enough to know that, but I like that there's so much, so many good cycles that nobody talks about or understands because nobody's bothered to look at them. Why? Economists don't. Economists don't think you can predict the future because it's too complex and things are ever changing. These cycles repeat. They may have a different twist every time. And there are cycles from thousands of years to 500 years to 40 years to 10 years to once a year. You know, the stocks do best into May. You know, I mean, it's just. There's all types of things that can yeah. help you see the future. It's not perfect, but it gives you a huge edge up. So I've just been, I, you know, I wrote a bunch of books on it and I've been writing a newsletter ever since 1989. And, and, and I still, I, I, I do interviews and stuff. People are like, well, Harry, you know, you can't, predict, or nobody can predict past the next election. I'm like, I don't even take the elections and the, who's going to win into account in my forecast. Yeah. That's how good these, these fundamental things and, people and when they spend money, demographics, technologies come in on a different clock and change how we work and live and how much money we can make um, and, and, and that sort of stuff. And then there's a geopolitical cycle, which we're seeing right now. I, 
you know, this whole thing with Putin, I'm like, hey, I'm sorry, folks. I know this looks really serious. I don't think it's going to last that long because the geopolitical cycle has been adverse for 18 years through all this terror stuff and all this stuff. And 9-11, this thing turned up in 2020. And we're mm -hmm. the next 17, 18 years are not going to be as marred by that. That's not going to be the problem in the economy, worrying about terrorist attacks and geopolitical events. So I so, you know, these things make life a lot clearer. Man, Harry, there is so much I, I want to dig into on that. I'm super excited to get into this. Um, there's a lot of I've been talking about these political cycles, uh, technology cycles and financial cycles, which you touched on. So I want to dig into that. Um, before I do real quick, um, you talked about you you weren't a trained economist. That wasn't what you were in, intentionally going to go for. But then you decided to. I'm just curious, um, you know, uh, most of the economists today, classical economists or Keynesian economists versus like uh, uh, an Austrian economist who takes into things, uh, you know, human action into consideration. So it seems like all the economists of the world, uh, the Keynesian economists, they look at data, they look at numbers, but without understanding the human incentives, the motivations, there's a lot missing. Do you see that? And would you put yourself more on yeah, like, yeah, the Austrian no, Absolutely. Camp? The few economists I like are people like Dr. Lacey Hunt in Austin. He is a classic Austrian economist and some other people I've seen. And, and yeah, that people, I agree because they look at, at, at the innovation and the business and consumer levels that cause change. You know, and, and, and what, the, what the Keynesians say, it's all about money. It's governments manipulating the money yeah. supply. And if they create the more money, you know, they, and, oh, oh, they can. Here, here's the problem I have with them. Their assumption, which is to me 100% flawed from the beginning, you can turn this dynamic, complex um, economic sphere into a machine. Now, right. you can turn some things into machine, but this is not one of them. You can't turn nature into machine. You right. can part of it in farming and stuff, but that's what they try to do. And they, their number one goal is just blasphemy. Avoid recessions. Right. Recessions right. are what create innovation. You find me a breakthrough innovation that did not come in a recession or depression or a war or some crisis. There aren't many because that's what makes people look at things different. So, so disruption comes out of crisis. And, and disruption is what creates the same person working just as hard in new technologies or on an assembly line instead of a, you know, a, a batch production thing can produce. And in the case of the assembly line, Henry Ford was having workers produce 10 times as much in the same time. That's innovation. That's what drives our economy. Yeah, more people better. People older with more experience better up until their 40s or 50s. But it really is innovation. And, and, and so demographic cycles, generations, because generations bring more innovations when they're young, growing up, and then, uh, then bring them into the economy and, and, and get them adopted when they're old enough to be powerful consumers and business owners and that sort of stuff. And also, right. and, and technologies have their own cycles. So these are the things that are important and they are surprisingly predictable. I predicted, Mark, right off the bat, first prediction in, in the mid eighties, I said, this boom started in 83 when the baby boom started driving the economy and it will peak at the end of 2007. I said that in the mid 80s. This is the, the greatest boom in history because it's the biggest generation. Right? And it will peak in 2007. And people will say, no, well, Harry it didn't peak. Look, it's time mark. <laughs> the reason we have had nonstop stimulus since 2008 is because they're having to keep a dead economy going printing massive amounts of money. And the stock market loves the money because it's going mainly in the stock market, not into consumers and the economy. So the stock market thrives on it, but the economy is much weaker, even though it's still growing. And the truth is we would have been in, in depression number two from 2008 till now, if they hadn't printed so much money and people say, oh, well, they avoided the depression. No, no, no. They avoided <laughs> restructuring all the bad debts and, and, and fostering a new, more innovative environment that would favor disruptive companies rather than penalize them and, and be uh, supporting the old companies that should be getting out of the way. And so they've really retarded our economy. I, I, I'm really worried that we, if we don't have a bigger washout, which I think is starting in 2022 and will happen the next couple of years, if we do not wash out this debt and, and zombie companies, I call them, which are up to something like 30% of companies, public companies, we won't have as strong a boom with the millennials because we'll be carrying a bunch of uh, wounded warriors right. into the next boom. Too much dead weight. I think yeah. uh, 
to, to your point about uh, the recession started in 2007 and not recovering, I mean, if you price, if, if you if you remove the amount of monetary uh, stimulus that we received, uh, things look different. If you price the stock market in gold, things look different. Um, so yeah. only when you look at it in dollars, it looks like, oh, they did pretty good. But <laughs> when you adjust it for real data, it, it shows a different picture. Um, but let's let's go back a little bit. So you referenced uh, the Putin Ukraine thing, um, and how maybe this was like predicted, and how you think it ends. So I guess that kind of goes into like this revolution cycle or populist regime, like re- populist uprising regime change cycle. So yeah. tell tell us about that cycle and how that's affecting where we're at right now. Yeah, that's a two hundred and fifty year cycle that goes back. In the American Revolution was the classic example of that. Um, and, and the Protestant Reformation before that, that was the biggest thing that happened to Europe still today. Right. <laughs> that, that's, that's looked as the biggest thing in European, uh, and obviously the American Revolution here. And so that's been happening. So we're, we're seeing yeah, revolutions around the world. A lot of dictatorships are falling. See, I think Putin is just the last one of this. It's, it's, the, it's kind of the last big dictatorship to fall and say, look, sorry, folks. That's an old model. Strong man, you know, suppress the populace. They make low wages, but the country does well and has a strong military because strong man taxes everybody, right. builds a military, and then bullies around the world. So that's been happening. That's all a history. Saddam Hussein fell and ended up in a trash can over that. I think Putin is going to fail. This is bad timing. Nobody in the world is supporting him. China's just shutting up. So they're not supporting, but also not. Opposing, everybody else is opposing this. This is not going to stand. It's bad timing. And it's just going to prove to other dictators and strongmen around the world, hey, this game doesn't work anymore. So if Putin fails at this, I think this is going to be the best thing that ever happened. But my geopolitical cycle, right, which is about a 34, 35 year cycle, you know, 17, 18 years good and 17, 18 years bad, rather than the demographics, which is more like 40 That cycle did turn up in 2020. And so I think that this will not last as long. I think this is kind of the end and will be a sign of the end of that cycle uh, when we look back in history and say, you know, after that, because I always always go through my presentation, think about 1983 to 2000, you know, before the tech wreck and all that stuff. And nothing really went wrong in the world. We didn't have the, you know, all these other, you know, global terrorist stuff, all that, all, you know, Nothing happened before 9-11. You know, there was a period, 1983 to about 9-11, where the world, there wasn't any big geopolitical problem. Right. And, right. and we take that for granted. Well, now people think, well, that's just the way of life. No, I'm saying I think the whole geopolitical environment is going to get a lot better in the next 15 years. Yeah. Uh, worse before it gets better? <laughs> no, I, no, I really think this is, well, I think the, what, what's going to be worse here is the economy. Since they have put, ever since the 2008 crash, which was, the deepest recession since the Great Depression. Okay, why? It was the beginning of the next depression. You know, right. two thousand eight to twenty twenty two was the that was the downside of the baby boom before the millennials take us to a next boom. So you'd expect the economy to be weak, but they stimulated their way out of it. So we never got to restructure all that debt and flush out the bad companies and make the economy stronger. So we have more debt than ever. Zombie companies are something like 30% of public companies. It's just insane. That's very unhealthy. So, so we're still unhealthy. We're growing on stimulus alone. It's a, it's a fake boom, as, as you were hinting at earlier. It's not real. So we need to flush this out. I think that's going to finally happen because you can only push this off so long. And, and, and we're about to enter in a recession after they printed more money in the last two years than all of the stimulus in the, in the, in the 13 years before it in two years. And, it, and the economy is now already turning down and, and COVID is over. So you can't blame it on that anymore. So I think this is the end of that stuff. And, and now we're going to come out with a stronger geopolitical environment, much more efficient economic environment. And we'll be able to have a productive boom from about 2024 to 2037 with the millennials and, and it'll be global too. Yeah. Now what about, um, you have, you know, you have a empire 250 year time span on an empire or 250 year time span on democracy. Uh, you, you reference yeah, that's two, the revolution cycle, that right? Is, that's the revolution that cycle. It, yes. So you, you, you mentioned the American revolution, which was 250 years ago. Here we are today. So you, you mentioned like the fall of the strong man, the dictatorship, um, one might argue Biden is somewhat of a dictator with all his executive orders as well. And we're at the end of a 250 year revolution cycle there as well. 
I mean, how does how do you factor that in? It's not just the end of uh, dictatorships. I mean, the end of the uh, American empire as well. Well, well, yeah, yeah. The American has been it hasn't been as controlled directly through war and stuff. But yes, the American empire has been the empire commercially right. uh, for a long, long time. And now we have a global boom, much more that right. America will never dominate like it did in the 50s, 60s, never again. And where's the real growth? It's in Asia. Mm-hmm. The next leading countries will be in Asia and in not Japan and Korea. They are way down the demographic. They, they have weaker demographics than we do. And Japan peaked in 1989. I predicted back then, Japan's stock market will never see a new high in our life. We'll never see 40,000 Nikkei again. And we won't. And we have, it. Right, you know, right. and, and, and we've just seen the peak of the bear market rebound. And I think it's going to be down for years to come too. So different world. It's always shifting. And again, this stuff, these cycles of empires and cycles of different countries booming when their demographics peak it, and now why Asia has to be the growth and, and why the only developed countries left to have good demographics are in Asia, like Australia and New Zealand. I just did an interview in New Zealand. I'm like, hey, you lucky guys down there, you know, you guys are the only Westerners other than Sweden and Norway, you know, you know that, that have good demographics. Um after you know that have a bigger millennial generation than the baby boom so so the world is changing again and the good news is it's predictable right. if you're may if you're doing well in the united states okay well you should be investing your retirement money more in asia after this next crash because the u.s will come back pretty strong because we have a strong millennial generation europe has no millennial generation except the most northerly countries and asia is going to is going to run away with the prize, um, yeah. but, but not you, East Asia, and not and even China is going to trail India by a mile in the next okay. boom. So that's what I was going to ask you to clarify. When you say when you say Asia, you're not including China because they have horrible demographics. You're talking about India and maybe yeah. South Korea or China, Vietnam. Japan, and South Korea have the worst demographics. Well, I tell you, the worst demographics in the world are Southern Europe, Central and Southern Europe, uh, East Asia, including China. Um, and East Europe, where all this East European countries are, are going to see populations decline twenty to forty percent this century. I mean, that's a that's devastating. So so they're they're going to actually contract like a, so these areas contract, and the biggest growth is Southeast Asia and India. That's where the next. So if the last wave was China, China still got a little more urbanization and stuff, but China has so overbuilt their economy, i.e. 22% empty homes and offices, okay? Yeah. So, so they already built enough to accommodate the people that haven't moved to urban areas yet. So not a lot of growth left there, but man, Southeast Asia and India gonna grow for decades. Now, um, since I've read many of your books, I'm very familiar with your theory on uh, your, your work on demographics, which I think is amazing. And I think it everybody should understand this because it gives you a different lens to look at things. Um, Frame that up for for the people that aren't familiar with that. So uh, how you look at demographics and why that matters, how it's predictable. Yeah. Okay. So in, in developed countries where I started in the U.S., right. I, I early on my career I was doing research for my for my customers and consumers. The new baby boom and and where, what age they were, where they're going to grow, where they are. And I real and I found the statistics astounding right out of the U.S. Bureau of Labor every year since 1981. They measure exactly when people spend money um, and, and people enter the workforce and all averages and averages is what matter in that. Sure. Enter the workforce on average 20, earn and spend dramatically more into age 46, 40 says 47 now is 46 when I started. Okay. Um, and then they peak and kind of plateau in the early fifties as their kids or some of them getting out of college, some of them, you know, whatever. And then they decline. Right. So, so, so I can go into any country and see where's the next generation, where are they, when are they going to peak, how strong it's going to be, are we, and when are they going to slow down? And, and so I can see this all around the world. And again, Europe's already peaked and has very little millennial generation. U.S. has a smaller generation, but significant enough to have a good boom from 2024 to 2037, but it's not going to be like 1983 to 2000. It's not going to be the same, boom, you know, giant generation and, you know, that sort of stuff. And, and we're not going to lead the world as much in technology as we did back then as Asia will start. But, but Asia, and I can tell you country by country, yep, not Japan, they're dying, not Korea, China, 
uh, has more urbanization to go, but they've already exploited that. And their demographics are the, China is the first emerging country to have their demographic spending wave peak and already back in 2011 and go down for decades. Japan was the first developed country and now every other developed country has followed them with only Australia, New Zealand and, and Sweden and Norway and Finland. Uh, still having some rising spending, but not as yeah, much yeah. as in the past. So, but the point is, it's predictable. Right. So you can know where to, where to grow your business. You can know where to invest your money to get higher returns. And it's not just like chasing stock markets that are going up because they're going up. Because because <laughs> best example in all of history, Kathy Woods. Yeah. She's Ooh. investing in disruptors, which are the best companies, which why she outperformed the NASDAQ three times in 2020. But guess what? Rise strong high and fall. She has she's down 60, 70 percent. And in, 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 in when the indexes were still going up in 2020 and now they're going down and, and people say, oh, she'll come back. No, she's not. Come, mark my word. She's not coming back. She's buried in this technology wave that has to shake out. And then it'll be great again, uh, 2023, 24, 40. If she's still around, she'll be the one to pick those stocks. I'm just scared she won't be around. And that's a shame because she's a really good stock picker in this right. arena. But you have to understand these cycles. Everything goes through cycles. People say, well, Harry, technology is always growing. No, they come in surges with clusters of new technologies that grow up together, like automobiles and electricity and phones. Those are like, you know, really powerful things and now computers right. and software and the internet and now crypto. These are all software oriented things that are powerful and, and growing together. So you have to understand they all have cycles and nothing grows in a straight line. It's an S curve acceleration and it's a decline and shake out. Then it's the next S curve or it's the generation and they peak and things slow down and shake out. And then the next generation takes us to new heights. The good news is it's predictable. The bad news is Things are always changing. And if you don't understand this, you're going to keep investing in stuff when it looks really good and it's going to fall apart and you're not going to understand why. And you say, oh, I'm an idiot. Yeah. You don't have to be an idiot if you look at these. But the best part about what you said, you know, these demographic and talent, the best part is they're simple. The cycles are simple. Right. 46, my indicator for these developed countries, 46, in some cases, 47 year lag for the peak in spending on the birth index. And I can adjust for immigrants and put them, I can put immigrants on average into their birth dates and, and include them with countries like the US or Australia, New Zealand that have high immigration. Now, real quickly, the emerging countries are a bit different. They don't have the steep spending curve and productivity curve, the leading edge technology, but they have masses of people. So I, I use workforce past and also easy to project the workforce age there about 16 to, to 64. I can project the workforce past and future and that shows me their spending wave, just cumulative workforce. So I can project them as well. And, and that's why I can tell people, hey, you know, these emerging countries are peaking already and these have the best going. And if I had to invest in one country, one country only for the next 20 years after this crash, it would be India without a doubt. Wow. So to summarize that, I mean, uh, everybody's different. Um, we're all made up of individuals, individual people. But when you when you average them out, um, our spending is predictable, um, and what yes. we're what we're buying and how much we're spending at certain periods over time. So if you look at the population, which all countries do census, we can see the population sizes. Then we can kind of predict where that money is going to grow. Which industries is it going to be? Baby products or is it going to be retirement products? Something like that. Yeah. Um, and then, um, and, and then when you take that uh, and then you look at China, which so China had this one child policy for the last, whatever, 40 years, which I would imagine just has completely just decimated their demographics to your point, right? That's why they're the first emerging country to peak and to peak and decline so badly. Yeah. So they, they kind of did that artificially. Now, when you're looking at uh, in financial indicators, there's never one indicator that's conclusive, right? So you're trying to look at multiple indicators. So as powerful as demographics is, I'm guessing there's lots of other factors that you have to take into consideration outside of demographics. So for example, you talk about technology cycles. Um, do you look at like the K wave, like the chondritive wave cycles that are like 40 to 60 year? Absolutely. Now, here's another, this is one of my biggest insights. What did I study if I'm a cycle man back in the 70s and early 80s? Of course, the Contradiff wave was the only credible long-term cycle. Well, there was a 500-year 
um, inflation cycle, which is really a mega innovation. Inflation is innovation, which produces booms on a lag. Okay. Okay. But those are the only two major cycles. Um, so, so the K wave is, is, is demonstrates the most important underlying cycles that any growing cycle life cycle has four stages like youth, early adulthood, mature adulthood, and elderhood retirement. Right. Okay. So four stage cycle. And, and so that the K wave always had uh, an initial boom, an inflation shakeout, and then a growth boom, a, a bubble boom, and then a depression, an ultimate shakeout, you know? So okay. that was the cycle four stages. So I'm studying this and then I realized, oh my God, you know, what's really happened. Even the K wave people lost credibility because they said it was a 50 to 60 year cycle, average 55 to 56, which it was which was two commodity, 28, 29 year commodity cycles when we were in a commodity time. Then the baby boomers and new technologies and services come in. Oh, now the cycle is a 40 year generation cycle. So you get two 40 year booms and bust of generations and a, and a spring Bob Hope generation boom and inflation recession in between. What was the inflation of the seventies and higher than ever? The massive baby boomers entering the workforce at great expense and low productivity. That right. was not government deficits and money printing. We weren't printing money back then. We were, were running deficits, which you do when the economy's weak, okay? So right. the deficit, the governments didn't cause that inflation. And my indicator tracked it and would have predicted without any, any government deficit spending and all that other stuff. And then you get the fall bubble boom, which is always the best. The technologies are really in their best phase. And, the, and that the second generation, for some reason, always tends to be bigger. The baby boom births and immigration in that case. And then the last shakeout is the depression. And that's what we went, had from 30 to 1942. And then you go forward 80 years and you get like approximately 2008 to 2022. And what, what happened here for the first time in history, governments fought this depression and said, oh, if we're going to have deflation. How do we fight that? We just inflate. We just print tons of money. And, and then everybody feels richer and spends money anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the problem is it's artificial. And most that inflation, you notice, OK, well, that should be inflationary. Oh, the consumer price index hasn't gone up until recently. Where did the inflation go? Financial assets. This is the biggest bubble and it's an everything bubble. It's been commodities. It's been gold. It's been real estate. It's been stocks and it's been everywhere in the world. Yeah. So um, if we go back to those, the K wave, the 50 year technological revolution cycles, <clears throat> I mean, it's like industrial revolution, um, steam engines and railways, steel, electricity, oil, automobiles, mass production, telecommunications in 1971. Uh, 1971 plus 50 years puts us right here where we're at today, which is another technological revolution. And each one of those drives new financial markets, right? So telecommunications, obviously telecommunications, internet, the computers have driven that before that it was G E G M right before that it was oil, <laughs> oil, railways, et cetera. Right. So, um, you look at the demographics, that's one big piece of it. But then if you have a new technological revolution, a new K wave, then that could also birth a new economy. Yes. And I mean, now, I mean, you know, a lot of people say, oh, crypto is yeah, invisible coins, is nothing. It's, it's way overvalued. It is way early stage, just like the dot coms were 20, 22 years ago in the late 90s. Amazon was six bucks, went up to 136 and back to six in that 2000 crash. Sure. And now it's, it's the greatest retailer in the world. So I see this crypto thing. The, the thing that got me to understand crypto years ago, a guy was speaking at my conference, okay, in San Diego or something, and he defined this revolution. He said, it's the digitization of all financial assets and money. Now, why did that light my brain up? I had just identified, I tell people in my presentations for years, the biggest number in the world is not the population at 8 billion. It's not GDP to 80 to 90 trillion today. It is $550 trillion in financial assets, stocks, right. bonds, real estate, all this sort of stuff. That Because that's an inflator. That, that's normally two to three times GDP. And because of this bubble, it's six to seven times now. Right. This is the biggest bubble in the world. And this bubble has to come down to reality. And imagine, just ask yourself, just say, forget anything else. 
demographic downturns, anything else, if half of that, if 250, let's say trillion, $270 trillion worth of real wealth and people's real savings and investment accounts disappeared because we had a reset in financial assets. You know, a home that was worth 300, it was 100,000 and now 300,000 now goes back down to 150 where it should be, okay? That's a big reset, 50%. Right. Massive. What does yeah. that do to the economy? What people know, their income hasn't been hit yet, but now they have no savings, their savings, their retirement's in question, especially older baby boomers. Oh, they're going to cut back right. their spending and it's just going to exacerbate a downturn that's in financial assets anyway. So this is, a, this is a once in a lifetime. I call this the crash of a lifetime, comparable not to the 73, 74, the 80 to 82, or 90, or 2007. This is comparable to 1929 to 32 crash, a reset that does not see new highs for decades. Yeah. So would you invest the same if you thought the stock market wasn't? Would you say, oh, I'm just going to hold through this correction because stocks always come back? And that's what my stockbroker tells me to do. Right, okay? sure, of course. Hey, <laughs> nine out of 10 times, that's the right thing to do. I agree with the stockbrokers on that. Right. Not this time. Right. It's a once in a lifetime reset. You you will you will never get back to even while you're still alive if you're an aging baby boom. Never yeah. get back to even. And in your real estate or your stocks. Yeah. Um it, it, if uh if if we could have met up while I was still out in Puerto Rico, we could have had a fun conversation with us. Now's not the time for it, probably. But um, you know, I would say that uh, the way I'm tracking is 50 year technological revolutions not new technologies, but revolutions that change the way kind of the world works and then create new financial markets. And uh, also we have these pendulums, right? So we kind of go from one side to the next, which I think probably goes into the cycle. So, um, you know, we go from like this centralization cycle to like a decentralization yeah. cycle, like a we or a me, there was a book written called the pendulum that kind of talks about that. Um, and then if you look at it even bigger, it looks like uh, if you look at it like a 250 year cycle, let's say the Protestant Reformation in the 1500s, um, the pendulum swung towards, um, 250 years later, the industrial revolution led towards centralization. So we went from, uh, in the 1500s, we went into the, um, Renaissance age, the age of yeah. enlightenment. So that was like a creative cycle. And then the industrial revolution 250 years later went into a techno, you know, more of an analytical cycle. And yeah, here and we very, are very heavy technology, much more technology than in the past. And now we're swinging back on a 250 year cycle, maybe back to a creative cycle, uh, which would be- and, and, Which is always in more, more decentralized because creativity to, comes more from decentralization. Which, which is exactly. And so the decentralized revolution, as I say, uh, it's not crypto, it's Bitcoin. <laughs> so Bitcoin is not crypto. So those two are uh, completely different. It's like trying to say metal is gold, right? Well- Gold is different than metal. So it's Bitcoin, mm -hmm. not crypto. Um, but <clears throat> Bitcoin is the technological revolution like electricity or the steam engine that will lead that next uh, growth boom. Um, and then back to the kind of financial assets, 500 trillion to your point, right? And so typically if, if, if we were trying to, if we were sitting around in Silicon Valley a decade ago, like what's Uber worth? Well, if it can get 10% of limos and 10% of rideshare and 10% of taxis, it could be worth X. So then you look at $500 trillion in financial assets. And if it could capture 5% of that, or 10% of that, what's the valuation model of that, right? Kind of a thing. Um, now, uh, you are coming to speak at my conference, marketdisruptorslive.com, which I'm very excited about. So we'll definitely sit down and uh, talk about this, this topic a little bit more. I've, uh, I've, I've, I've looked at tons of your research on Bitcoin, so we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, but back to, um, back to this. So we have the demographic boom. Um, or bust, I guess. Most that's countries. approximately a thirty-nine to forty-year cycle. Generation right. booms. You know, uh, exactly. I'll give you late twenty-nine, late sixty-eight, peak adjusted for inflation for the stock market, and two thousand and seven. Those were thirty-nine years apart, exactly. Right. That's so, a generation cycle. So most of the world, the developed world, the Western world, is going into a demographic bust, a cliff. You wrote a book called The Demographic Cliff, which I read, and I re recommend everyone to go read The Demographic Cliff. So the world's going into that, which is a problem. Um, at the same time, we're at the end of this, you know, a Ray Dalio, and I'm sure you have a cycle for it, like a long-term credit cycle, an 80-year financial revolution cycle. Um, <laughs> So those are bad. <laughs> those are bad. But then we have uh, some millennial populations that are coming up. Plus, we have a new K-wave cycle that's starting, and that's good. <laughs> so, so where are we at in the world right now? Like, what's what, Where are we at? I mean, we have bad, and we and we have good. Um, 
do you see, and, and I guess you've been calling for it. Actually, you just said the crash of a lifetime is coming up in front of us. Um, so <clears throat> while all this is setting up, we have the crash coming, but then there's new life that will come on the other side of it. So you're not a doom and gloomer. <laughs> there's no. problems, but then there's hope on the other side. And, I, and I've been bullish for most of my forecasting career. And the people who call me a per perma bear conveniently forget that. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I was the, the guy saying great boom ahead, Dow 10,000 by 2000 in the late eighties. And people thought I was absolutely crazy for thinking the Dow could get to 10,000 by 2000 when it was 1800 at the time. And it actually went to 1200, 12,800 and, and greatly beat even that. So yeah. that's, that's just the way it is. You know, if people just extrapolate trends into the, in the future. And if you go below or above that, people think you're crazy. So that. Uh, so, so before I ask the next question, let's jump into that for a second. So, um, a lot of people think you are uh, the broken clock who's wrong. Uh, you know, will be eventually right. Uh, who's wrong, but will eventually be right, kind of a thing. I've said, uh, having read your books, like your analysis is correct. Um, it seems that maybe you've underestimated what the central bankers were able to do. Um, yeah, and how long they could do it and how, get away with it. Definitely, no question, underestimated that. <laughs> okay. So the research that you've done is correct, but it's the, it's the timing. How do you find the timing, especially how can you guess how many more tricks they have up their sleeve? Well, what, what I tell people is once you get a bubble like this going, it's artificial and, and, it be, and they, they exponentially support it. They don't just, they understand and they've learned from keeping this bubble going now 13, 14 years that if they don't put up more, the bubble doesn't keep going. And that's the exact nature of an artificial bubble rather than a fundamental one driven by real trends. OK, right. So what's happened is they've just created and this is this is, I think, the death knell to me. This is what's telling me it's finally over. Last two years, COVID gave them the excuse to, to print way exponentially more <laughs> yeah. in the two years. And here we are. Just after that, already the economy is heading back towards a recession. In other words, it's not where you're getting diminishing returns. And you yeah, diminishing that. returns. Yep. Anything yep. artificial. I mean, think of any drug. It could be alcohol, heroin, crack. Uh, coffee, even it takes right. more and more to keep somebody high or to get somebody keep it high and 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 to keep from coming down. But right. the longer you do it, the the bigger the crash and the bigger the detox. Let's call it. Sure. We're what I tell you, we're heading for the biggest detox since the 1930s. Okay, because we've artificially pumped up the economy. The, the detox should have been 2008 to 10. Okay. In the cycles, we cut it off in early 2009, blew ourselves out. Of it. Now we're going to just got to make up for that, have a bigger detox. And until we have this detox, we can't come out of this. And I always use the example of Japan and their demographics are weak, but they did have a millennial boom that was substantial, not to new heights, but they did have a millennial boom in 2020. And they, they, they've had a damn near zero economy. If you don't re restructure the debt, and get more efficient and favor the more efficient companies and weed out the old, you're, you're gonna be very <laughs> sluggish and, and not be able to take advantage of the next boom. So, so we can continue to do this. I, my theory is no, we've done it so extreme, it's gonna backfire. The central banks have created this the greatest bubble in history and that bubble has to burst because no, you cannot have an economy or stock, you can't, particularly stocks, grow at 10 to 20% a year when the economy is struggling to grow it too. Right. And then, see, you can't keep doing that. Stock, yeah. Stocks have to crash at some point. And when they do it, it's going to be massive. And that's going to, that's going to destroy that 250 to $275 trillion wealth of real, real to people, artificial, but real to people, financial assets. And that will hit people like, bam, yeah. and they will spend differently and save different. They will save more and they will spend less. And, and then all these things will come down even more. And you have to have a crisis at some point to get back into balance. And again, I'm promoting it as a good thing. And I'm promoting it as our duty as aging baby boomers who have got the benefits of this stupid bubble yeah. to not bring all the liabilities of it to the next generation, our kids, the millennials. Yeah. So, so this is just, this is the right thing to happen, but it's also going to be good long-term but it has to happen. I think it's happened. Now, here's, here's, but here's what I've been telling my subscribers, Mark. It's really simple. I can't tell 
if a bubble bursts, because the bubbles aren't based as much on demographics as these other real cycles. It's an artificial thing pumped up by God. I can't tell it's burst until I see about a 40% crash in two to three months. That's every, I measured every, all 12 bubbles in the last 120 years, okay? And the sign of it was the first crash, minimum 28%, maximum 50%, average 41%. But the key thing, that first crash happens in two to three months. Okay, we're two months into this. If we continue to crash more exponentially into say early April, and we're down 30, 40%, three, three or four weeks from now, that's gonna tell me this bubble's over. That's the first crash. You're gonna get a couple months of rebound, bounce, yeah. retrace, and then you're gonna go into that long dredging downturn in stocks and depression. That's the only way you know the, the bubble is over and once the bubble's over, it 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 falls on itself and it just it's just a snowball going downhill. What about in March of 2020? Because we dropped about that far and about that fast. And then we had the bounce and it looked like it might have okay. followed that. that pattern, was, okay. that's different. That was an artificial okay. crisis, very short term. And, and, and that's when they printed five times as much in two. I mean, that's when they just went berserk. So what if next so, time so, they do the same and they print that 10 that times? much stimulus lasted so short and we're already in on the verge of a recession again that is not being caused by an artificial crisis shows the economy's failed. So that was short term. That that gave governments an excuse to, to go really crazy and nobody question it. And now it's failing. So so yes, they 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 blew themselves out of that one. I'm saying they cannot blow themselves. They I am predicting right now they will not blow their way out of this one. We may go up and make one more new high at best, but I say by the end of this year, we're in that first, we've seen that first crash. And once you have that first crash, the rest will probably be more predictable yeah. because the bubbleness is taken out. Yeah. You know? My, uh, my good buddy, uh, uh, Greg Foss, career bond trader, he says, I can tell you what's going to happen or I can tell you when it's going to happen, but I can't tell you both. <laughs> oh, exactly. And, uh, but you, yeah, I'm you, more than that. I can tell you what's going to happen, and, but I can't tell you when until I see a sign of it. Exactly. Yeah. But, but you do like to, you do like to put dates on that. Um, but, uh, I think to, to your point, right, we're seeing the law of diminishing returns. And so like their, their effects are having less and less and less, and eventually they'll have no effect at all. So it seems like they'll probably continue until they just can't anymore. Um, well, and, well and I'll give you an example. We're having it now already. Housing has gone up and up and up. At some point, people, everybody feels richer and stuff, but there's a point where the new younger buyers coming in cannot buy at right. all. And then the housing prices start going down. So housing prices have gotten so high from the bubble that now the reason home prices are slowing, and I'm telling you, I also predict by the end of this year, home prices will be down, not up because they're already losing their momentum and the next stage is to actually go down. And they're already, I was just talking in Australia, New Zealand, and they're seeing home, and they have way bigger bubble and stronger than we do, way better demographics, all the Asian immigration. And their market is weakening for the first time. They didn't even have a downturn in the, in, 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 in the uh, uh, GFC, they call it, the great, you know, the 2008, nine crash, when yeah. real estate went down 34% in the United States for the average home. So. It's, it looks like it's happening to me. I need a little more confirmation. I think we may, I may, I think I may be confident enough in the next several weeks to say, okay, we've seen that first crash or not. And if we haven't, I'll say, I think it's coming late April, say into June, July. And if we see that first crash, then I get more predictability again. But until then, I, I need that sign. And I think, I think we're in it now. Yeah, well, we're we're, cert we're certainly seeing some softening in the in the housing market. Um, it's slowing. We're seeing that happening right now. Of course, rates went up a little bit, so we'll see what happens there. Well, hey, I'll, I'll give you one thing real quick, Mark. The lead bubble in this one, okay, it was the dot com stocks and Amazon in in the two thousand tech bubble. The lead one is obviously crypto and Bitcoin. Bitcoin is down fifty percent overnight and will not make a new high. And it, it only surges one year every four years. It's just a total bubble industry. It makes all its gains in one year every four years. It did that in 2021. It came down just like it did in 2014 after 13 and 2018 after 17. And it's not, this is going to be the first time it doesn't make a new high for a long, well, it never makes a new high until four years later. And I, Bitcoin is going to continue to crash. And that says to me, we've already seen the peak. Because uh, it's the lead bubble, so so there's always earlier indicators of anything than and later leading and lagging. The
The leading indicator for me has been and continues to be Bitcoin. In fact, I'm, I've been telling my subscribers lately, stocks lag Bitcoin short term by about seven weeks. Of course, in the NASDAQ, we've seen half the stocks in the NASDAQ down 50% or more. Uh, we've seen, uh, to your point, Bitcoin and crypto, yeah. Bitcoin down 50%, the crypto is down 70% or more. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's what you're talking about. They're and Kathy Woods. Kathy Woods is down about 70%. Right. So that's the that's the leading part you're talking about. Or you yeah. think there's continued crashing for, to come from those? Well, they're the lead and everything else follows. So so at some point, I mean, crypto, after already being down or, or, or tech leading tech stocks, 50 to 70 percent, they're not going to go down another 50 to 70. Right. They'll they'll keep drifting down. But other stocks will follow and start to crash 40, 50 percent. Right. And, and in the end, in, in a crash like this, after a cycle like this, you're not looking for a 40 to 50 percent correction in stocks. You're looking for 70 to 90 percent. And of course, the tech stocks and crypto more crypto. I'm looking. My target is to see uh, uh, what was it? The the the, the leading uh, uh, Bitcoin down to four to seven thousand. Nobody in the industry. I got I'm down here in Puerto Rico with a lot of Bitcoin and crypto people. Yeah. That, they don't see that's possible. I think it's the likely scenario. Four to seven thousand in the next year or two. That says that bubbles over, and that says the whole bubbles over. Well, you so said it, you said it, you said if it's down fifty percent, it doesn't have another fifty percent to go. But to get down to four to seven, it would have to go go a lot more than fifty percent from here. It'd have yeah, fifty percent, yeah, from here. Not enough, not that for yeah, not the fifty percent stuff because that would take it to zero. But you're right; it is going to go down a lot um, more, and it's and it's going to continue to lead. But uh, the biggest thing's going to happen from here is that the rest of the market's going to follow. Yeah, the uh, leading you know, technology stocks, which, which happen to be crypto this time. So in a, you know, at the end of a long-term debt cycle, uh, the only way out of a, the only way out of the debt is to either default on it, which the governments can't really do, um, or they can try to print their way out of it. So there's an inflationary crash or a deflationary crash. Either one is a crash, but you're not in the inflationary crash. They are, right. you, you're in the deflationary between me. I debate Peter Schiff <clears throat> and anybody these days. The first half of our presentations, we whoever goes first has to knock out half their slides. You know? Yeah. Because <laughs> we have the same. This is a bubble. It's not sustainable. It's not real. Blah, 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 blah. I have more of the demographic argument. He has it. But we differ because what he sees is, and, and this could happen, is it goes down and governments just get more crazy and they print exponentially more. I say they don't have the credibility to. This is not Weimar Germany when they lost the war and borrowed money overseas to do it. And when their currency collapsed, those overseas debts went up 50 to 100 times. And, and they just had, I mean, it was crazy. This is not that. Yes, we borrowed too much, but it's not that sort of thing where they just totally lose control. So, so I don't, that, that's the hyperinflation that they just have to print exponentially more money. And there's just no other thing that they do. I think that when the deflation starts, they'll lose credibility. People will think, yeah, money printing really was something, but nothing. It doesn't work. And the dif But the real thing is inflation goes at this speed. Deflation goes twice as fast. OK. Right. Um, and, and because fear out greed is heavy, but fear runs faster. Fear always trumps greed. And so when this crash gets going, you've got to remember all the dumb money, the dumbest money, the everyday person piled in in the last year or two. That's why Kathy Woods bit the dust. She's buying the real up and coming innovative stocks that these people couldn't even spell them near there. Know them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And they're only buying the big, you know, Microsoft and Apple and, you know, whatever, you know, and the leading crypto stocks, you know. And so those stocks dominated the last year and her stocks crashed, even though they're better stocks. Right. So, so that's what killed them. So when they go down, they just pan, they're the, they're, they're going to sell and that's going to start a crash that will just go exponentially. So that's how a crash outweighs the government. They will not be able to print. And you got to remember the government's been in a printing mode for a long time. And finally it's gotten so extreme that they're saying, yes, we have to taper and tighten, but slowly, softly, sure. just to taper here and to be in that direction. First of all, it needs exponential more, so it'll crash. But it's, second of all, it's hard to change that policy without looking like, oh, my God, we panicked and we can't control this thing. We got to go back to crazy land again. So, so they're not going to react fast enough. And this deflation is going to hit like something we know happens when you eat bad food. Yeah. So um, 
I would like to ask you, we'll go ahead and start wrap, wrap it up here. Um, but I would like to ask you um, in the deflationary crash and understanding cycles. So typically you kind of made the point earlier, like once the, once the market has already kind of achieved some success, people rush in, but it's already kind of too late. You need to be rotating to the next sector. Um, so I would like to ask you um, in this deflationary spiral that you think what sectors to be in, but I'm not going to have you answer that question because I'd rather people come see you at my event, Market Disruptors Live. <laughs> and uh, if they want to know the answer to that question, they could uh, either read your books, which they should, Zero Hour, you got it behind you, or come see me at the event. Um, so, so we'll save that uh, that that question for then, I guess. Um, I guess. Uh, so anyway, I guess we'll I guess we'll wrap it up with that. Probably a pretty good time to do that. Um, besides that book, Zero Hour, is there anything else that you want to bring people uh, put people's attention towards? You know, no, I, I really think uh, the best thing to do in this case, and this has been my experience for many, many years, I, there's, I'd say only one out of 20 people would get, get it from my books better than coming to a presentation in just one hour, hour and a half, because it's concise, it's live. People just learn from that better. So the best thing you can do, this is critical. I understand what I'm saying is against what everybody's saying, shouldn't be possible, I'm telling you. I have outstudied all these people in history, and this is totally possible, and this is the exact right time in cycles in history for this to happen. But you really need to hear it to be convinced enough to make, you have to make some hard decisions here, including, right. and I did, I did, so. I sold my dream vacation home, okay? I sold it because the vacation homes are the most overvalued and go down the most. And, and so you're going to have to make some hard decisions, especially about real estate. It's not so hard on stocks or bonds and stuff. And, and so you really need to get convinced. So, so I'd say if you get a chance to hear like, you know, a full presentation with all the charts, I, I do not talk out of my, you know, ears. Okay. Yeah. I basically, fat, I don't say a thing without putting a slide behind it and proving it happened in history or proving the cycle or whatever. So the, the key thing for people is they get convinced of this because this is the most important you stand to gain and or lose the most in the next two to three years than any time in your lifetime. I'm just telling you that by my, if, I, if I'm, if I'm even half right. And, and, and people don't realize if you just get in the safest bonds, you know, that normally would return very little and give you a 2% return, like a 30 year treasury bond, that bond in 2008, that bond went up 40% when stocks crashed 56%. I'm saying you can go up 50% or more when they crash 80%. You could be making money when everything else is crashing and then turn that money around because the mm -hmm. bonds will only be good in a crash and then buy stocks and real estate at the lowest prices you'll see for the rest of your life and, and then massively grow your mind. This, there is no more opportunity. So people hear this and go, oh my God, you're depressing me, Harry. If you wake up and get this, this is the greatest opportunity you could ever have in investment to make money, not just to protect from losing, to make more money than you could ever dream of in a short right. period of time. Oh, that's such a great way uh, to put it. Yeah, it's not about doom and gloom. There is a lot of problems on the horizon. We're witnessing a lot of gloom, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but if you can survive this the right way, then there's massive hope and prosperity on the other side. Um, so perfect point to end on. Um, and so with that, uh, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I appreciate you breaking this down for me today. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of yours. I, I, your research has been spot on. Timing, it's been tough. Most people can't, most people don't want to predict when, it. When governments are controlling the economy, timing's always going to be hard. Yeah. All right, Harry, with that, we're going to go hey, ahead and wrap real, it up. Real quick, Mark, yeah, yeah. I do have a free, you know, I have a newsletter, but I have a free every week, you know, a couple articles, free newsletter for people to get to know me at yeah. harrydent.com. So Harry you can Dent. go there and just get on our free newsletter and then decide if you want to listen to us more. But I, you can't go wrong doing that right now. Yeah. Harrydent.com. We'll go ahead and put a link down below for everybody to check that newsletter out. It's free. Uh, I've been reading this stuff for years. So if it's good enough for me, it's good enough for you. Um, so we'll link to that. And then, of course, come see them at the Market Disruptors Live event, marketdisruptorslive.com. And uh, with that, we'll go ahead and sign off. Thanks so much, Harry. Thank you, Mark. All right, that's a wrap with the interview with Harry Dent. Hopefully that made sense for you. Like I said I, uh, at the beginning, I know a lot of people think that he's been wrong, but he's actually been right. You just have to understand the nuance of what his research says, and then you can figure out how to use this information, this research for your own investments. Of course, we left a cliffhanger there. Uh, Harry has a very strong opinion of what's gonna happen over the next two to three years, and even more specifically, what you should be doing to survive that. 
And it's information that I take seriously and you want to come here. So come check out marketdisruptorslive.com. There's a link down below. Um, as always, give me a thumbs up with this video if you like it. If you don't like the video, that's okay. Give me a thumbs down, but at least leave a comment and let me know why. And that's what I got for you today. All right, to your success. I'm out.